Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Greetings, Blue Blazer regulars, and welcome to Movie Oubliette, the trans-equatorial podcast for forgotten, fantastical films, with me, Conrad, recovering from the shock of going to a wedding in Cambridge, UK. Cool. And me, Dan, casually making covers of 80s and 90s classic songs in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> We focus on sci-fi, fantasy and horror films because we love interdimensional travel, kisses that bring true loves back to life, and bug-like aliens living among us disguised as men called John. Mm. Hello, Dan. Hello. Hello, Conrad. A wedding, you say? I know. It had lots of people at it, and people. Yeah. And they weren't masked. It was, yeah, quite a strange experience wow. being around that many people. Was it outdoors, indoors? It was indoors, which is even oh. scarier. Yeah, too cold here for outdoors events at the moment. But yeah. it was quite a large hall that we were in. So, huh. but yeah, it seemed really strange. I don't think I've had that experience yet in uh, 2022. No. So, yeah. I've been boosted, though, and uh, no side effects, which was good. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I'm glad, yeah, because I was not for six when I had my booster. You really had nothing at all. Had a bit of a sore arm, and that was it. Mm. No, oh. like, even even the second uh, jab, I had some fatigue, uh, but nothing. Mm. Just a sore arm, and that was it. Nothing else. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so you've been putting your arms to good use on the synthesizer, though, I see. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I I posted a cover of um, the message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious, Furious Five. I also did a cover of Cats on Mars, which is a track from the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack. It's very very <laughs> obscure. Um, but I'm currently working on a Daft Punk song, so hope to pull that one off. Oh, I'm sure it'll be amazing if the Grandmaster Flash ones had anything to go by. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's really great stuff. So any great stuff in the mailbag today, Conrad? Well, we have a new patron to welcome on board. Hello, Darren. Ooh, Thanks for hello. becoming a patron. Yes, welcome aboard. And we've also had people giving us feedback on the chrome statue of Mothman that's standing in Point Pleasant yes. in Virginia. <laughs> quite a, quite the sight. <laughs> <laughs> he is, yes, especially from the back. Uh, Kevin from Planet X had a photo from the back. Yes. He said, a shot from the reverse side shows that Mothman loves doing squats. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because... Yes, he has quite the uh, quite the rear end. Yes, and he does. Uh, Serge of Cold Crush Pictures said, "Putting the thick in mythic." <laughs> <laughs> yes, Which I really loved. Spelt with two C's, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my what a big pair of silvery buttocks they mm. were. Um, <laughs> completely changing gears on uh, our last episode's topic, Crypt of the Vampire. That wicked person said, It seems like once they cast Christopher Lee in a bevy of Italian beauties, they didn't put in much effort after that point. They must have thought it was already a winner and just banked on the cast and the atmosphere, making it a hit. And there's a whole lot of eye acting. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, he thought an alternative title could be The Castle of Staring People. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and Crash Zooms. <laughs> oh, yeah, Crash Zooms on those eyes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Eddie Coulter, who nominated that film for us to cover, he said, you hit it on the nail on what I liked about it, which is the music and the gothic look of the film. I'm not hurt that it was sent back to the Oubliette. Oh, yeah. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I have a weakness for gothic and anything involving Lee and suggested oh. that some other good non-Dracula Christopher Lee roles, some of his favourites are Horror Express from 72, The Devil Rides Out from 68, The Wicker Man, 
73, oh, yes. which I think I think a lot of people have seen that one. The, the better uh, movie, I, <laughs> I assume. It's his favourite, actually. I think it's his, yeah, no, not, 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 the, not the bees. <laughs> yeah, not that one. Um, <laughs> Hound of the Baskervilles from 59, Rasputin the Mad Monk from 66, The Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers. I'd forgotten Ooh. that he was in those. Okay. And... The Return of Captain Invincible from 1983, a superhero musical that also stars Alan Arkin, in which Christopher Lee sings. <laughs> okay. So I am really intrigued by yes. that one. <laughs> yes. Can we, can we please do one of these movies in an in a episode this year? We we must. Yeah. I think it should be The Return of Captain Invincible, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> We'll see. Maybe okay. we'll put them all on a wheel and just spin it at some point. Mm. And, of course, we heard from our correspondent, Serge, oh. of Cold Crash Pictures. Oh. Hello, Serge. Hello, Serge. Who said, Crypt of the Vampire is nobody's passion project. Written over a weekend with Christopher Lee likely guilt-tripped into signing on, it's little more than a messy <laughs> and mundane cultural curiosity. But then again, I did keep whispering, I can fix it. All throughout my screening. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Probably could too. Yes. So there we go. Thanks for writing in, everyone. We always love hearing from you. Yeah. Great comments. Yes. So we better pick something else for people to comment on, Dan. What are we doing this episode? Okay. Well, I've just got off the phone with the president of the United States. And he's, he's just informed me I have to get something called an oscillation overthruster. I'll just go to the Uber and check. Oh, uh. oh, I'm in some sort of press briefing. Oh. Excuse me. Oh, I think it's over here. All right. And what's that watermelon doing there? Oh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I think they're about to start and coming back. Evil, pure and simple from the eighth dimension. Oh, that was strange. I am back. And what do you have for us? So today we will be uh, attempting to discuss the movie from 1984, (laughs) The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, a sci-fi action adventure uh, American film directed by W.D. Richter and written by Earl Mac Rauch. Roche? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And it stars Peter Weller, John Lithgow, Alan Barkin, Jeff Goldblum, Christopher Lloyd, Wow. Lewis Smith, Robert Ito, and uh, quite a few other <laughs> characters uh, that we'll get into. It's, yeah, it's an amazing lineup of character actors as well that people will recognize from other 80s movies. Yes, and they have hair. <laughs> which they, I was yes, I know. quite surprised with. <laughs> yeah, every single one of them. So. <laughs> What's the synopsis? Good luck. <laughs> well, this film, I mean, the scrolling title card says it all. Buckaroo Banzai, a brilliant neurosurgeon dissatisfied with life devoted solely to medicine, roams the planet studying martial arts and particle physics. <laughs> Collecting around him a most eclectic group of friends, those hard rocking scientists, the Hong Kong Cavaliers. <laughs> Throw in a dimension traversing jet car Ford pickup truck, a love interest that could possibly be his ex wife's long lost twin sister, bullet spinning aliens from Planet 10, randomly placed fruit, a device called <laughs> the flux capacitor, I mean the oscillation <laughs> overthruster, and you've got the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We are in for it here, I think. Yes, there's a lot to unpack (laughs) after the break. Okay, we are back to talk about the Avengers of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. What a mouthful. Uh, I would like to start off by saying I'd never seen this movie before. Had you, Conrad? I had not, so this is a... Double Blind! Uh-huh. Uh, yes. Uh, also, 
Is this the first Jeff Goldblum movie that we've covered on the podcast? I think it is. I can't think of anything else he's been in that we've covered. Yeah. Yeah. I looked through his films and yeah, I don't think we've covered anything. I mean, we've seen Peter Weller twice already Mm. in Screamers and Leviathan. Mm. Christopher Lloyd, first movie that we've covered? Yeah, I think so. And John Lithgow, even though we've done yeah. a Brian De Palma, I don't think John has cropped up before. Yeah. Hey, who was the bad guy in How the Duck? Oh. I'm thinking Christopher Lloyd, but it's not, isn't it? It's Is not, it? no. There are a lot of crossovers and potential influences here. I think his name is Jeffrey Jones. Yes. Okay, not Christopher Lloyd. It's not Christopher I'm Lloyd. I'm just picturing him in How the Duck. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this movie is quite dense, actually. <laughs> uh, the first time I watched it, I was very confused for the most part. Uh, there yes. are a lot of scenes, actually pretty much every scene mm-hmm. where I had just a list of questions. Like, <laughs> why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why did he say that? Even a simple thing as Jeff Goldblum, I didn't even realize he was in the first scene. Right. When I first watched it. (laughs) And so when he just shows up and joins the merry (laughs) band of crazy rockers on the bus, I was so confused. Like, I didn't realize he was one of the surgeons in the first scene. Yeah, I recognized his voice, thankfully. But yeah, so you're introduced to the main character who is late for his own world land speed record. Yeah. Possibly experiment into interdimensional travel, although I think he does that under his own steam and it wasn't planned Mm -hmm. but he's late for it because he is currently operating on somebody's brain because he's also a neurosurgeon yes and jeff goldblum is assisting him and i think this sets the tone of the film quite well because after they finish buckaroo bonsai is so impressed with goldblum that he says have you ever thought about joining my troupe yeah can you sing yes And he says, I can a little and I can dance. And he says, great. So it's absurd, but said with complete straight faced seriousness. And I just Mm. from that point on, I thought, okay, I think I'm getting the tone here, which is (laughs) it's just insane. But we're going to just play it completely straight. It's absurd. The whole, every single scene is absurd for one reason or another. Either like weird, strange in jokes or people dressed as cow. I mean, Jeff Goldblum turns up dressed as a cowboy with big, fluffy (laughs) chaps. Uh, What? Like, what? I mean, and his band of scientists are also a band, a rock band that play saxophone rock music yep um and he's a neurosurgeon and he he's in some sort of back to the future jet car that just looks like a pickup truck with like sheets of metal attached to it and a a rocket (laughs) strapped to the back of it (laughs) yeah so it's kind of a cross between new kids on the block and the a team headed up by a guy who is a neurosurgeon a particle physicist And a daredevil. Yeah. And also the lead singer of a rock band. And also the lead singer (laughs) of a rock band. Wow. Yeah. All of it is set up as though you're just being dropped into, I don't know, episode two or episode three of a serial. It's... It has the same inspirations, I think, as Star Wars and Indiana Jones and all the other filmmakers who were coming of age in the 80s. Mm. You know, and it's the same, you know, it's yellow lettering at the beginning that's sort of telling you some backstory. But whereas Star Wars sort of gives you a sense of this is you're being thrown right in the middle of an ongoing war here. Mm. Just hang on and you'll be along for the ride. But it's it's dealing with fairly archetypal, simple things. Yeah. Here's a lady dressed in white. Here's a guy dressed in black and they're shooting at each other. I, I think I know which one I'm supposed to be rooting for. This is just like so dense, such a layered onion of a world. And you're given no explanation and no key to any of it. And I had never seen it before. I went into it completely blind. Me too. I read nothing. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing other than the title and Peter Weller. And I'll be honest, the first time I watched it, I thought, what the hell is this shit? I finished it and was just (laughs) so vaguely angry and also bemused, but just not really sure what happened to me. But it has to be said, the second time I watched it, All of a sudden, it sort of made sense. (laughs) Yeah, it clicks into place on the second watch. There are a lot of things that don't make any sense 
at all mm. and then you watch it again and there are all these little things that you pick up on and little things that people say that go oh okay that makes sense now i mean even okay before we go into the characters we haven't even touched on the alien aspect of this movie which is just right you know elevates it to another <laughs> absurd level this kind of really weird comedy like kooky, campy things happening. I feel like it is quite an 80s and 90s thing. Mm. Like there were a lot of sort of really strange comedies like Aeroplane and Steve Martin movies and even like Blues Brothers. It's like a world separate from reality, but they just make it work, yeah. you know? And, but that doesn't exist anymore. That type of cinema does not exist. No, I, I was trying to think of the... I mean, Men in Black is probably the most appropriate 90s reference. I yeah. thought of that too, yeah. But I think the closest you get to it now is probably Guardians of the Galaxy. True. Certainly True. the way that it has been interpreted on screen. I don't know the source material, but I know there were a lot of people scratching their heads thinking, Marvel, you're really going to try this thing with this raccoon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And because of the talent of the writer-director James Gunn, he makes it work and resonate emotionally. Yes. I'm not sure this resonates emotionally. It's just a world of its own that's completely anarchic, but exuberant with it. I mean, it's full of exuberant, crazy joy mm. and told completely with a straight face and complete seriousness throughout mm. and so you get the sense that it's also subtly making fun of all the high concept science fiction blockbusters that were around at the time yeah so it's kind of counter-cultural yes yes I, I was thinking back to the future but it came out the year before back to the future came out i know and i think back to the future owes a debt to this doesn't it you've got the crazy haired scientist played by christopher lloyd yeah. and a flashing thing that's in a car that's yes. the key to the technology that enables it to travel through a dimension of some kind. Yeah. Hmm. Mm, exactly. Like, it, it just seemed eerily similar. Yeah. But it came out before... Howard the, the Duck future. as well, I think, is another one that is clearly a reference. You've got a scientist who's been possessed by an alien during an accident oh, in a scientific yes. experiment who's trying to repeat said experiment in order to free the rest of his people. Mm, I mm. think it's a complete rip-off, to be honest. I can't see how it cannot be. Yeah, because this movie, like, bombed. Oh, yeah. It bombed so hard that the studio went bankrupt. Really? Oh, gosh, I didn't read that. Wow. I'm not sure whether it was because of it, but I think it was one of the contributing factors. Oh. I think they have been trying to make, a, like, because at the end, the closing credits, there's like a sort of teaser for the sequel. Yes. But the sequel just never happened. Watch for the next adventure, Buckaroo Bonsai Against the World Crime League. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sort of his spectre, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's all part of this bigger mythos that they were very keen to expand. I mean, Earl Mac Rauch, Rauch? Rauch? I'm not sure. He, when he was developing this, wrote script after script after script after script and didn't finish them. So there are all these half finished ideas. Wow. All as crazy as this. Mm. The thing that's fun about it is if you watch the special features on the Blu ray, they treat it as though this is real. Right. And on the commentary track, the writer is pretending to be the real life Reno, one of the Hong Kong Cavaliers. Uh, and they're pretending yes, right. that this is a docudrama. Right. This is a documentary about the real guy. <laughs> you know, it's fun. It's the world yes, that they're yes. building, genuine world building. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the world is kooky. <laughs> but it's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> there apparently have been two attempts to adapt this into a TV show. Oh. So in 1998, Fox Network planned Buckaroo Banzai Ancient Secrets and New Mysteries and even created a short animated test reel. And then that fell through and then... Uh, Kevin Smith was attached to it for a while, 2016 with MGM. There was an Amazon deal, apparently, but that fell through because of some sort of lawsuit with the original creators, something to do with the rights to it. And then Kevin Smith again was attached. Recently, apparently, uh, has been pitching it to Apple TV, uh -huh. but now it's going to be an animated. So instead of live action, it's going to be animated. Okay. And he did talk to Keanu Reeves as being a possible voice for 
Buckaroo Banzai. So that could be quite interesting. But yes, an animated series. Yeah. I can see personality-wise why that would fit. I mean, Keanu has been both an action star, played characters in a highly technological world in The Matrix, and he's mm. also been Bill and Ted, so... Or, well, one of them. <laughs> yeah. And, like, he is... I think it's a small percentage, but part Chinese or an Asian descent. Oh, uh, nice. I mean, I the, the Asian part of this movie, zero cents. I mean, he's supposed to be half Japanese. At one point, Bakuru has a sword, a samurai sword, and he's in some sort of Japanese traditional kimono or something. Oh, but yeah. then he doesn't do any martial arts during the film. Whatsoever. No. So <laughs> that's very true. And the the band of merry men are called the, the Hong Kong Cavaliers, and not a single one of them are of Asian descent at all. I mean, I do feel like the eighties was the start of a lot of Asian influence into Hollywood movies, like Karate Kid coming out and mm. <laughs> that little China movie. What's it called? <laughs> Big Trouble in Little China as well is a good Big Trouble touch point. in Little China, yeah. yes. Because yes. Uh, W.D. Richter wrote that script, the director of this movie. Right, and, right. And again, it's ahead of its time. I mean, a lot of people talk about Bokaru Bonsai being just a little bit ahead of its time for the audience to really latch on to the full insanity of it. Mm. Big Trouble in Little China, which was W.D. Richter's next project, I think is the often cited other example of that, where it's taking all of these influences from Hong Kong action movies and, mm, exactly. and unleashing it with all of the crazy mysticism and magic and a whole world building again. But that, I think, was slightly more successful, but again, struggled because 20th Century Fox just could not figure out how to market it, which I think mm. was the same issue here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would have liked to see some Kung Fu, maybe. I mean, it would have completely made it even more bonkers than it was. Well, yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it kind of would maybe explain some of the things, because uh, they kind of, yeah, they don't really utilise the whole Asian influence to this movie. No, they don't. It's basically an alien invasion plot. Yes. Where John Lithgow is playing this scientist who's been half possessed by yeah, an alien. But he waits so long. Why is I I guess he's waiting for someone to crack the oscillation overthrust the code. Yep. But he spends all those years just in an asylum asylum. Waiting for Buckaroo Bonsai just to... Just waiting? Apparently, yeah. I None of it makes any sense because the flashbacks which refer to Buckaroo Bonsai's childhood when his father was doing these experiments, that's in 1938, it says. So that's 46 mm. years before... If the film is set in the year that it was released, or around about the time, so 84, mm. that's 46 years. I mean... Lizardo's aged well, hasn't he? Well, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't look like he's 70 or 80. <laughs> no. I was confused by that flashback as well, because why does he electrocute himself? Does that make the flashback happen? What? what, what? I mean, it's wonderful that the flashback is triggered by him electrocuting himself in the hospital. But <laughs> yeah. I think apparently he subsists on a diet of Twinkies and electricity. I think that's what Lithgow has said in interviews. Oh, as an alien. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, because they don't really come back to the whole electric part of him. No. Ever. No. It's not explained. <laughs> Nothing is There's explained. There's a lot of things. Yeah, there are a lot of things that they kind of allude to, but then they just don't come back to it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and the same with character-wise, the Penny Peggy situation. So we're introduced to this character played by Ellen Barkin, very early role for her, mm. playing Penny Pretty. She's at a gig that Buckaroo Bonsai is having with his Hong Kong Cavalier mm -hmm. band and she's going to kill herself and he stops the whole gig to talk to her and plays a song to her. She still tries to kill herself. She fails because some waiter jostles her. Yes. He refers to her as Peggy when he's talking to her, even though she's told him her name's Penny. And you think that's just sort of callous thoughtless superstar on the stage just doesn't care enough about his fans to get their name right. But then it emerges mm. that he's mistaking her for a woman he was in love with before who died, who it then transpires could possibly be her twin sister. Yeah. But it's not explored at all. No. So... And it's a weird <laughs> love interest as well. She's just 
automatically attracted to him. Everybody And he's is. only yeah. attracted to her because she looks like his ex-wife. I, I don't get it. Uh, I mean, her character is just there. She doesn't really do a lot. Yeah. Even at the press briefing, she blurts out like she actually understands the technology of the oscillation overthruster and mm. is actually brilliant, but they just brush it off. They just kind of joke about it. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So she is, is she smart? But then she doesn't really have any more lines. Yeah, or do anything and just ends up being a damsel in distress who dies at the end. Yeah. I mean, it's not great in terms of representation because I know some people have noted that the red lecturoids are exclusively played by white guys and they're the bad guys. And the good guys, the black lecturoids, are played by black actors in full dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. So great. But as far as the Hong Kong Cavaliers are concerned, I think they're all exclusively white and male. They are, and quite confusing because they are pretty much all the same person. Even though they look very distinctively different, I keep confusing them yeah. because they didn't seem to have any characters. No. <laughs> they were just the same guy, just looked different. Clancy Brown is in there yeah. as Rawhide, who you remember because he dies. Yes, Clancy Brown. I was shocked looking him up because... Behind the scenes, we're doing a video essay on Highlander. We are, Um, yes. (laughs) And he he plays Kurgan in the first Highlander movie. Yeah. The big bad. And I was just shocked. Yeah. Totally different guy. He's a very talented actor. You get a sense of his range. He's really likable in this. So you you are actually quite sad when he dies. And it's quite nice to see like a film with an A-team bunch of people that are on a secret mission and there are stakes mm. because they get injured they some of them get killed mm. including the love interest at one point so yeah. yeah yeah another very tiny character that is in this movie that ends up being quite a famous actor is the hospital guard yeah. at the <laughs> Salem asylum that's Jonathan Banks who people might know him as Mike from Breaking Bad he's also in the later seasons of Community I was shocked again they have hair. These <laughs> actors all have hair because, uh, yeah, in his older roles, he's definitely very bald. He is. I do remember him from, because in this era, he was in Beverly Hills Cop, right? in which John Ashton also appears, who is in this as a cop. And he was also in Gremlins as a dopey policeman that didn't believe Billy when he said that the town was being overrun by little green monsters. Right. So, yeah, I am used to seeing Jonathan Banks with hair. Yes, but yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Another sort of smaller character, one of the um, Johns, one of the aliens, <laughs> the three henchmen aliens. Um, it's played by Dan Hidea, mm. who ends up being in Mulholland Drive, a whole bunch of really great movies, Alien Resurrection. I mean, Alien Resurrection's uh, debatable. Mm. Uh, Life Less Ordinary, Usual Suspects, Clueless, and Cheers. Yeah. As well. He was in the Coen Brothers' first movie, Blood Simple, as well. Oh, He's no longer with right. us, sadly. Oh, right. Yeah. It's an amazing cast. Ronald Lacey is in there as well as the president. Right. Made up to look like Orson Welles for some reason and in this weird device where he's in traction because of his back or something. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, to me, it just looks like a giant hamster wheel that they've (laughs) attached a hospital bed upside down <laughs> it, it's just absurd <laughs> crazy but it's yeah crazy. ronald lacy i think everybody will remember as um i think it's tote i'm not sure how you pronounce it t-o-h-t the german who melts in rages of the lost ark oh, right of course although he was a very accomplished actor and yeah numerous roles but that's what he'll always yes. be remembered as melting guy uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> We have to talk about the biggest, most memorable actors. So we've got Christopher Lloyd, Jeff Goldblum, John Lithgow. And Peter Weller. What do you think? <laughs> I felt Christopher Lloyd was underutilized. He was barely in the movie. He is barely in the movie, but he is undoubtedly Christopher Lloyd, even under the ridiculous alien makeup he's wearing for the majority of his scenes. Mm. It's definitely him. Yes. I love his name as well. I mean, it's a stupid joke, a running joke, but John Big Booty or Boote, as he always <laughs> corrects yeah. everyone. This running so gag. So funny. It is. <laughs> 
Yeah, so all the aliens that invaded Earth around the time of Orson Welles' radio broadcast of War of the Worlds because of one of these interdimensional experiments, mm. they've been hiding out all with pseudonyms that begin with John. Yes. And because they clearly did not understand how surnames work, they've just picked random things. So they've got things like Big Booty, Small Berries. Yeah. There's John <laughs> Yaya. Yeah. I think there was John Little John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Christopher Lloyd is there underutilized because John Lithgow, bless him, is just chewing up the scenery as Lizardo <laughs> and loved it. Lord John Wolfe. I loved it. He's yes. modeled his performance on a cross between Mussolini and a tailor who worked at the studio who had an Italian accent. Yeah. He got him to record all of his lines on tape so that he could master this accent. Just his physical performance, the way that he lurches it's ridiculous. along yeah. and every time he says a line, he does these really bizarre, twitchy facial expressions. Crazy. He's wonderful in the film. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of Igor from <laughs> Frankenstein. He's just kind of cowering and like twitching and with, with his, his back hunched and, and then randomly just screaming. Yeah. <laughs> With his eyes wide. Oh, it's a sight to behold. It is in this big fright wing. Mm. Yeah, he embraces it full bore. And he said that his sons think that it's the best work that he's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it's debatable. Yes, it is. Peter Weller is a figure that we should talk about, too. I think he is perfectly cast here. I really liked him. If you want someone who could convincingly be a rock star and a <laughs> neurosurgeon and a physicist, I can't think of anybody else who could nail it like this. I mean, I've never seen him in comedy before. Right. So, I mean, we have saw him in Screamers and Leviathan, very serious roles. Mm. One sci-fi, one horror. And he's like sort of the head guy that has got to lead his crew. And then obviously Robocop. Yeah. He's emotionless in that. So seeing him in this, even though he does play it serious, mm. it's quite refreshing seeing him in a comedy. Yeah, he totally nailed it. He said it's a combination of Jacques Cousteau as a scientist explorer oh, yeah. and Adam Ant. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure whether I get that reference. Maybe I haven't seen Adam Ant. Look at the gig at the beginning. Look at the way that he's dressed and his makeup and his hair and his eyeliner. And he's nailed it. He does look like Adam Ant in his sort of Prince Charming era. So, mm. yeah, he's absolutely okay. nailed it. He was asked to pick two people who he thought were extraordinary. Yeah. And that's who he picked. Right. Great references. I definitely found him very captivating throughout the film. Like, he did really push it forward and he sold the stakes you know the perils yeah he, he made it believable yeah yeah sometimes the mode of performance is pitched quite ridiculous but he has complete conviction in it and you, you're sold on it he gets across this sense of buckaroo bonsai as this very serious guy i mean the first time you actually see him after he's done this interdimensional experiment mm. he's not responding to the people on the radio that are asking him questions but he is investigating all of the things that they're telling him about you know that mm. you instantly get this sense that he's a very serious very focused guy he's got an you know an amazing mind and maybe socially a little bit in it yeah so you might even say suspect he's somewhere on the spectrum perhaps but yeah captivating and then when you see him in the gig scene where he cares for penny and mm. tells everybody that's sort of jeering at her when she's talking about her troubles hey don't be mean we don't need to be mean so mm. he's kind of a spiritual leader as well as an intellect and an action guy yeah yeah and he pulls all three off yeah because i think the an easier route that they could have gone with his character is to play him as the klutz as the guy that just seems to save the day but screws up everything in the process because that is mm. quite a common anti-hero or hero i guess like with the naked gun movies and and hot shots and all those sort of more like parody type movies yeah they could have played it like that but i'm glad that they didn't well, there, interestingly, there is one scene. They had terrible trouble with the producer while they were making this movie because he just did not understand what they were doing. And he constantly kept saying to them, 
your hero cannot wear these red glasses. And finally, they settled on he can wear them three times. But if I see him wearing them in a fourth scene, you're fired. Wow. Just oh, weird okay. dictatums like that. And one of them was a scene at the end where they're in the um, red electroids, the um, bad aliens lair. Mm. And one of the characters, I think it's Jeff Goldblum, says, where are we? And his response originally was, I have no idea. But they've dubbed over it with, I don't want to tell you. Right. Because the producer said, our hero, our protagonist, must not have no clue what he's doing. Hmm. Huh. Okay. So they tried to get a hint of that in there, and it was erased in post. And it's interesting to compare that with W.D. Richter's script for Big Trouble in Little China, mm. which was his next project, where the central character, Jack Burton... Is, is a, yeah. completely inept. Yes. And yes. is actually not the main character. He's the sidekick. Yeah. And he doesn't realise it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, that is a trope. And that could have been the direction they could have gone with. I mm. mean, Chris Pratt pretty much does that in Guardians of the Galaxy now. Yeah. I mean, he is pretty good. He is, yeah. He just doesn't take anything particularly seriously. He is skilled. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. Mm. I mean,. Does he ever play other characters? I mean, he is amazing. Mm. There's no doubt about it. He could have no lines and he would still be amazing. But yeah, <laughs> he is so Jeff Goldblum in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's full Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah. But in some respects, he's almost like the audience eyes. Like he points out things that other people don't point out. Like the watermelon. <laughs> like the watermelon. Yeah. Which is in reference to the problems they were having with the producer. They weren't sure whether the producer was still watching the dailies or not. So to test it, they shoved a watermelon into a scene. No way. And had Jeff Goldblum <laughs> stop and point and say, why is that watermelon here? And they left it in there to see whether the producer came back the next day with what the hell is this watermelon scene? And he didn't. So then yeah. they knew that they were wow. safe. Wow. <laughs> That's such an iconic line. I love it. <laughs> it's great. And it's all just to test whether the suits were still keeping a beady eye on them or not. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's another scene where there's just random grapefruit, just huge grapefruit just on the table for no apparent reason. <laughs> yeah. And just oranges in the background. Just, I don't. <laughs> they must have just been testing. I think they were. The whole thing is a bit of a prank. Yeah. But not on the audience. Yeah. You either buy into it and go along for the ride or not. Mm. It can just leave you cold as it did on my first viewing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of people would be confused by this oh, yeah. movie. It's, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, even that scene with the 3D projection hologram thing and they all have to wear these ridiculous glasses that look like they're made out of bubble wrap. Yeah, they are. <laughs> are they? <laughs> yeah, it's bubble wrap. <laughs> wow. You have to look very carefully at all the props and the signs in this movie because there's so much in it that is just absolutely absurd. Yeah. Like when the president gets his declaration of war, the short form. Mm. <laughs> yes. For emergencies. <laughs> really crazy. Like the signs that are in the red electroids layer. Mm. Like there's one sign that says, nobody comes in here, but spelt C U M Z, <laughs> secret, but spelt E C K R I T. Just, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. What is it's this? just the aliens just not getting it and doing their best job of imitating it. Yeah. Bless them. Um, and they spit bullets. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Scary, I guess, but like it only happens twice, three times. Yeah. And and then the spiders <laughs> that paralyze people. Yeah, and one of them kills Rawhide. Yeah. And honey is poured over Penny to torture her. I think they're ants. going to yeah, they're gonna put ants on her with honey. <laughs> I, I don't know. But what is that weird slug creature? No idea. What <laughs> I'm sure it has a massive backstory that's all in Earl Mac Rauch's uh, mind, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I've got more questions. I mean, the defense secretary, they just 
waltzes in the lair <laughs> and goes around. Where's my bomber? Yeah. He's just intent on finding his bomber. He's just an oblivious what? blowhard. <laughs> Yeah, because the Yo-Yo Dine, the Red Electroids cover is this corporation that does technologies and obviously mm. very successful because they're aliens, I guess. Yes. And uh, they had a military contract and the Defence Secretary wants them to deliver on it. And he's just completely missing the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Mm. There is a lot. A lot. There is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for Random Trivia. So, Dan, what fascinating piece of trivia have you dragged back from the eighth dimension on the axle of your rocket car today? <laughs> mm, well, uh, I think you might know about this, but uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was supposed to play Buckaroo's mum in a flashback uh, sequence, yeah. which was cut from the film, which is apparently in the um, the, the Blu-ray. Did you watch it? Yes. I haven't seen I it. I did watch it. Yes. Oh, I will send it to you. Yeah, it's a home movie of uh, the father doing early experiments. I think it's the experiment that that ultimately cost them their lives. Right. Yes, Jamie Lee Curtis is Buckaroo Bonsai's mum. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, apparently the the photo on the dashboard of the jet car is her. Oh, wow. Okay, Um, yeah. But it's hard to make out. I don't don't know. It's not. Yeah. It's not clearly Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, it could be anyone. Yeah, she, I have seen it, and yeah, it was supposed to replace. I think the opening title right. card with all of oh, the text. Right. Yeah, it was supposed to replace that, but oh, okay. it raised more questions than it answered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole movie raises so many questions. <laughs> what yeah, were they scared? Exactly. Of? <laughs> I know, exactly. And the, the title crawl at the beginning just raise, raises more questions yeah. than it answers. So yeah. I, I don't really don't know what they were worried about. But there we yeah. go. <laughs> I have another small piece of trivia. I, I hope this is real, but um, the end song for the credits, apparently, according to Michael Boddicker, was not finished in time when they shot that, oh. that scene where they were walking, that iconic scene. Um, and so he just told them to play... Um, Uptown Girl by Billy Joel because it was in the same sort of vibe and uh, the same tempo. Right, I can see that. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And that's our trivia. Mm. Okay, shall we talk about music? Yes. So the music is by Michael Boddicker, Mm. who we have come across before. He did additional work for Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin, Mm -hmm. behind Mm -hmm. the scenes. Although (laughs) when I contacted him about it, he said, what now? What film? (laughs) So I don't think he remembers it particularly well. I mean, if you look at his filmography, though, he's done synthesizer work for a lot of movies mm. a lot and mostly uncredited yeah he's like the unsung hero of synth scores mm. for movies it's incredible yes and the work he does here is i think very effective it's just slightly cheesy but the thing that i love about it is even like the early scene when you're introduced to buckaroo doing this test drive of this rocket car that goes through the eighth dimension or whatever Mm. it's played with the serious pomp the sort of thing that you'd get from harold faltermeyer on top gun you know there's all right yes there's no sense that it's making fun or trying to be cheesy just just a little hint that maybe this is a bit ridiculous but not much yeah i i really like to score i mean it 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 does very cheesy but it really does suit the sort of tone of the movie yeah and that last the end credits music i mean Mm. it's just the cherry on the top really uh, in terms of the movie like that weird walking dance number where you're just (laughs) walking on one of those los angeles aqueducts to some very cheesy synth, yeah. synth music. Yeah, it's quite an iconic track, that one. The soundtrack's never been released, unfortunately. Really? Oh, wow. Which is a shame. Yeah, I like the work. I like the arpeggiators and the mm. the drums. and I don't know. It was, it's, it's very iconically 80s. It is, yeah, especially sort of the synth guitar rock for the fight scene in the layer at the end. Oh, it's yes, all very right. exuberant and fun and I don't know, it just feels like 80s TV almost. It's setting the right energy. The whole movie did give off a much more of a TV vibe mm. rather than a 
movie cinematic vibe. I think that was partly due to the cinematographer being replaced. Yeah. So originally it was Jordan Cronin with, mm. but it, he was replaced by Fred J. Camp, which gave a, a much more kind of flat, campy vibe as opposed to um, Cronin with, who did Blade Runner. In altered states. Yes. I don't know whether it was the look or whether he wasn't working fast enough, but certainly the scenes that you can see that he worked on, like the club scene at the beginning. Right. I mean, it's detailed and incredibly beautiful. Mm. And then the rest of it is quite flat. Yes. I mean, it, it kind of suits the movie. Like, the movie is very colourful. Like, every character is wearing some crazy outfit with crazy bright colours. So, mm. I don't know. Maybe that's what they were going for. Yeah, quite possibly. I wish they had kept Cronenworth for the whole movie. Yeah. I think it would have been amazing. Yeah. There is one scene that possibly he he directed um, when the two hunters discover the thermopod. Mm. Just like a lot of light leaks and lens flare. It just looks really like modern, actually. Yeah. It looked like... Close Encounters type sort of lens flare. Yeah, it does. And it, again, it's it tonally at odds with what is actually happening on screen, which is ridiculous. Uh, that scene is just, every uh, line is like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Who are these guys? Yeah. So w- one of the hunters says, where are you going? And the other one replies, Christmas shopping. And then he says, what's that? And he comes back, it's a stick. What does it look like? (laughs) (laughs) What is this movie? (laughs) Who are these guys? Yeah. Yeah. Tonally, this film is just utterly, utterly ridiculous. I did find it kind of similar in terms of just the absurdity to Toys. Right. And I was trying to figure out how is it different to Toys? I enjoyed this one more. Mm. And Toys was very whimsical. And this one, I don't know, I it had like stakes involved. So I felt like they were going towards something. They were moving towards an end goal. Whereas toys, I don't know, it just kind of flip-flopped around. It didn't seem to have a clear direction. No, not certainly not one that you could care about. Whereas this has tropey elements in it, such as the damsel in distress that needs to be rescued. You have the pending invasion of Earth. Mm. Or are they just trying to leave Earth or something? And certainly there's a threat of the destruction of Earth. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think Earth was going to be destroyed if they let the red electroids get away or something. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't... Uh, the ending was confusing because John Warfin, the John Lithgow character, was trying to get to the eighth dimension yeah. with the uh, oscillation of a thruster, but he, his version of it was just not very good no. and he didn't go to the eighth dimension and then so they just ended up flying around yes um, the quote I believe is we're not in the eighth dimension we're over New Jersey <laughs> yes <laughs> so yeah yeah. I don't, again I'm mystified as to actually what is happening but the framework is there you know that these are the bad yeah. guys and they have to be stopped or destroyed mm. and meanwhile there's just all these layers of ridiculousness Mm. told with the straightest face <laughs> yes. and a, Michael Bodica's exuberant score. So yeah. it's a sight to behold and an experience, <laughs> that's for sure. It really is. It really is. It's hard to explain this movie. It is. You just got to watch it. <laughs> I think so. Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Moobly Awards. Okay, it's the Moobly Awards. It's where we present our favourite bizarrely dimension-hopping parts of the film in a number of <laughs> oscillation over thrusting categories. <laughs> Best quote. There are so many. I mean, this so film is many. just <laughs> eminently quotable. Yeah. And I'm sure it's legion of fans, whatever they must call themselves, probably Hong Kong Cavaliers or maybe Blue Blaze Irregulars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My personal favourite, although say it's so hard to pick, is just a combination of the line itself and the delivery and the way that it's shot is the moment when Peter Weller walks into the press conference with his new alien vision that he has that he's been given Ah, by the black electroids and he just points at at Christopher Lloyd and the other guy and shouts evil pure and simple from the eighth dimension (laughs) 
<laughs> and the camera pushes in on him and does that sort of Jaws vertigo zoom mm-hmm, mm-hmm, dolly mm-hmm. thing. And it's it's just ridiculous, ridiculous. But I loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a very um, they live moment almost. Um, <laughs> yes, that's true. Another reference. Yeah. Undoubtedly, the best line is, why is there a watermelon there? I'll tell you later. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so unexpected. And I mean, the movie's bonkers as it is, but having a character point out something that's crazy, it's just, and also it's Jeff Goldblum. I mean, he's, he's the guy to point it out. <laughs> best hair or costume. All of the Hong Kong Cavaliers have got amazing costumes mm. and Peter Weller's character, Buckaroo Bonsai, has great costumes throughout. Mm. I think the one you've already mentioned it is, is Jeff Goldblum rocking up in this bright red jacket with yes. the um, gold buttons on it and the furriest chaps I've ever seen. I mean, these yeah. are voluminous chaps. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's got like a 10 or 20 gallon hat on top of his head. And he even has like this matching calfskin luggage, <laughs> which yes. is very eye catching that he yeah. brings with him. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, the Cavaliers—they look great. One of them, though, he's he's wearing a brown suit, bright red shirt, yellow shoes, and two belts. Oh, that's Reno. He's wearing yeah. two belts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One red, one yellow. Mm. Great outfit. Most eighties movement. I would say the band scene. Uh, yes, me too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean everyone's wearing sort of very eighties fashion, but like which, I mean, I guess I think of the eighties as everyone just walking around in suits um, for mm. some reason, like boys and girls, just blazers and ties. Um, and also the the band room, there's just fluoro neon tube lighting everywhere. Yeah, just every but, surface has got <laughs> it's got a neon. But light in pastel in shades, though. Yeah. So yeah, the light is quite beautiful. I think this is Jordan Cronenworth's scene, mm, right? And there's a lot of diffuse, a lot of smoke, and yeah, mm. a lot of atmosphere. It's a beautiful scene, really yeah. quite striking visually. The band, though. I mean, pretty pretty classic '80s. You've got saxophones. You've got the drummer playing uh, one of those hex- hexagonal uh, electronic drums, Simmons drums, yes. uh, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I noted that down too. So '80s. You've also got Peter Weller <laughs> doing a, a guitar solo, and then what looks like a flugelhorn solo, which is <laughs> yeah. amazing. <laughs> An instrument he actually plays, I really? believe. Wow. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> he is. Yeah, he plays jazz with um, Goldblum all the time, apparently. Wow. Yeah. Favorite scene. This movie is just a, a mass of anarchic craziness. I, it there really are so is. many scenes that I love. <laughs> if I was forced at gunpoint to pick one, oddly enough, it would be the end title strut, oh, because. Yes. It just fills you with this big warm smile to send you away on. And it's the first time I think the whole film is exuberantly silly, but with played with a completely straight face. And I feel like the end title strut mm. through that uh, damn set is probably, well, it's not a set, it's a location, is probably the most, you know, obvious fun that they were all having. And I right. love the fact that the whole crew is back again even the ones who died <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah. they're all strutting around and with the credits coming up i mean um, it's yeah, it's, I it's, it's it. not dissimilar to you know the end of a stage show when all the characters come yeah. like back on stage and do a bow like it's, 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 it's yeah. a equivalent it is yeah i i love it yeah so that was filmed at sepulveda dam in san fernando valley also used as a location for escape from new york and most recently bts's video kinetic manifesto in 2020 yes. so there you go popular location yes yes and for you patrons yes i have said that twice now <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes sometimes. Yes, yes. Become a patron now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my favourite scene, uh, again, I have to go back to the watermelon scene. Yes, it's, it is definitely up there. Um, <laughs> but I also do really love every scene that John Lithgow screams, John, big booty. Uh, and, and then <laughs> Christopher Lloyd corrects him saying, it's big. Bootay. <laughs> <laughs> Most cliche sci-fi moment. Just the science labs. 
I mean, especially oh, right. the yeah. science lab <laughs> with uh, the flashback scene with John Warfin or Amelia Lizardo. Yeah. And science is not science without just Tesla coils everywhere. Just thousands oh, yeah. of Tesla coils going bzz, bzz, to show <laughs> electricity. You got to have them. <laughs> yes. And beakers and dry ice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've got to have all of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least there isn't somebody rubbing a glass with their finger. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although that wouldn't look strange in this movie. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Not at all, no. Uh, for me, I thought the biggest sci-fi cliche was characters with alliterative names. Oh. Uh, so you have, of course, Buckaroo Bonsai and Penny Pretty. Yes. And I've noticed this in a lot of, well, Marvel characters because Stan Lee was a fan. Apparently he only did it because it made it easier for him to remember the oh, character name. Okay. So Peter yeah. Parker and Sue Storm and Bruce Banner. and Right, but right. You see it in a lot of 80s movies. So Marty McFly in Back to the Future, mm-hmm. Bastion Balthazar Bucks in Never Ending Story. Right. And even in the 2000s where you're doing movies that are sort of referencing the comic book era so Donnie Darko David Dunn in Unbreakable so and Richard Riddick from Chronicles of Riddick yeah so oh, lots of okay. lots of alliterative names I've in sci-fi never, for some reason never noticed that but now I'm gonna see it everywhere <laughs> see it everywhere yeah <laughs> Best special effect. My favorite special effect is the eighth dimension traveling sequence because oh. it's this spectacular experimental stuff that looks like molecular microscope imagery or. Yeah, right. Yeah, very trippy, the whole thing. And I particularly like some of the details in it, like the painstakingly rotoscope targeting laser that's coming out of the rocket ship, which they've clearly frame by frame added onto the um, footage which is incredibly shaky because of the speed yeah so yeah yeah. uh, you know a a lot of effort went into that whole sequence and i thought it was actually quite thrilling all of it yeah i mean it it actually looked very convincing as well with Mm. with the rocket on the back of the the pickup truck um yeah and when he does go into the eighth dimension it it felt almost like cosmic horror. Mm, like it, yeah. it, it felt like another movie almost. Like it wasn't silly or, you know, weird things popping up. It, it felt quite like ominous. Yeah, and Lovecraftian. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> uh, I really liked the the ship design, actually. Yeah. So it almost looks like driftwood, actually. Uh, so, mm. But it's quite organic in its, its sort of uh, design and shape and I did really like the scene where it burst through the building, the, the brick wall, because it looked mm-hmm. really impressive, like I'm, I'm assuming model work yeah, but it looked great mm. Favourite sound effect So the thermopod that flies over the hunters it looked like a moth, sounded like a hawk or some sort of falcon or something <laughs> what <laughs> i don't know yeah oh, yeah i don't know <laughs> and the, the hunters sort of think that that's what it is as well don't they yeah, are they going they after it, it. With, yeah shoot it yeah yeah my favorite was the homing beacon that buckaroo bonsai is using in the red electroids lair to track oh, down yes. his overthruster or whatever it's called yeah and uh yeah it, it sort of indicates right and on on the soundtrack there's like a turn signal sound like, oh right <laughs> like right, in a right. car <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, it seems pretty on the nose sonically but yeah. i thought it was funny because it just it just didn't seem of the right scale to be coming out of a device that small mm. but who knows yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Most funniest moment. Yeah, we have mentioned so many funny scenes. The watermelon scene. Uh, I did find in the band scene when Penny does shoot the gun and then everyone <laughs> on stage just pulls out a gun. What? <laughs> Every single band member is packing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, they've got to protect Buckaroo Bonsai, of course. Mm. Yeah. It's because of their dual nature as both a boy band and secret agent team of 
world defending I don't know and they're the scientists they? as well <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah no idea funniest for you my funniest scene was uh, I mean it's hard to pick but as you said it is so joyful to see John Lithgow and Christopher Lloyd playing aliens and being at odds at each other over Big Boutet's name yes. pronunciation all the way oh. through and there is a scene right at the very end where they're flying in their spaceship and they're bickering and mm. <laughs> unbeknownst to John Lithgow's character behind him Christopher Lloyd's character gives him the finger yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's just it's the fact that he punches first and then flips him the bird yeah, it's yeah. just Christopher Lloyd's physical comedy is just wonderful and John Lithgow fun fact he says if you watch him carefully in that scene he's laughing Oh. He actually breaks character and laughs because he knows what Christopher Lloyd is doing behind him. Right. So he actually broke character and I think he tries to hide his face by putting a helmet in front oh, of him or something. Okay. But he actually cracked up. Yeah. But all of them were having terrible trouble throughout the movie keeping a straight face because the director was wetting himself most right, of right. the time. Yeah. All right. That's our movie. please. Hello, this is Robert Picardo, and you're listening to Movie Oubliette. Okay, it's uh, final verdict time, Conrad. Should mm -hmm. the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension be set free into the world with all its alien friends called John and be appreciated <laughs> by all? Or should it be smothered with honey, electrocuted, and sent back to the eighth dimension deep within the oubliette, <laughs> forgotten forever? Conrad, mm. <laughs> Buckaroo Banzai. Yes. Well, this is exactly the type of film that I was hoping that we would discover through this project. <laughs> I have to say, if you had asked me after my very first viewing, in or out, I would have gone, definitely throw this back in, what the hell is this? Yeah. I mean, there are various things to be admired in it in terms of production design and just daring, frankly, mm. and mm. a fantastic cast. But what the hell is happening? Why is anything <laughs> happening? Is this meant to be entertaining? Is it supposed to be funny? Is it supposed to be serious? But then you watch it a second time and it makes so much more sense and you are so much more acclimatised to the the rich, wonderful world that it's created. It does have problems. It's not great in terms of representation mm. at all for, for women or ethnic minorities, including the ones that it's sort of hiving off a, a lot of its influences from, quite mm. frankly. But, I mean, it's such an exuberant, well-meant piece of fun that once you're in the right gear and the right frame of mind for it, you there's just so much to discover and so much to enjoy. And I spent the second screening laughing so much because mm. I finally got what the joke was. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, yeah, I, could, I just found it irresistible second time around, and I'm sure third and fourth time I will find more and more and more to enjoy. So um, I would say, yes, l let it go, but let everybody know it's going to take you a while to acclimatise to the world of Buckaroo Bonsai and the Hong Kong cavaliers or whatever yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i yeah i mean it's it's clear that i i will ag agree as well this it's very dense for a, such mm. a silly completely <laughs> almost idiotic film it's very dense in terms of yeah. jokes in terms of world building in terms of characters like it's actually quite surprising watching it a second time and noticing so many details that you didn't notice the first time everything about this movie is telling me it's a terrible movie but <laughs> i had it's filled with glee that's what i have to say it's just completely uh, just brimming with glee and it's yeah second time watches highly recommended and you just have to give in to the the nonsense. You just have to let it flow <laughs> over you. Don't try to understand anything. Just just go with the absurdity. And yeah, it's a fun ride. It is. 
Yeah. It's ridiculous, but it's not frivolous, I don't think. Yeah. They do want you to have a good time watching it. Yeah. And it's not ludicrous because it's lazy or bad. It's ridiculous because it's been designed with lots and lots of layers of ridiculousness carefully troweled on. Mm. Um, it's quite an accomplishment, really. Yeah, and, and you can do no wrong with Peter Weller, John Lithgow, Christopher Lloyd, and Jeff Goldblum. I mean, those four actors alone yeah. stand out yeah. in, the, in this film. Definitely. Ellen Barkin... It's, it's great. She's not given a, a lot to do, yeah. to well, be fair. Yes, but yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that is one of the problems of the movie. But, yeah, for what it is, I salute it. So. Yeah. <laughs> but watch it twice, listeners. Watch it twice. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Let me just throw it in the back of this rocket car. <laughs> Remember, no matter where you go, there you are. Be free. Goodbye. Off to the eighth dimension. Yeah. <laughs> oh my that was a discovery <laughs> yes yes and and if you want to discover our future episodes follow us on all our social media platforms facebook twitter and instagram as movie oubliette and we are also now on reddit as movie oubliette pod yes we are and you can email us if you're more old fashioned like myself at movie.oubliette at gmail.com. And if you haven't already, please give us a rating and review on uh, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, or whatever other podcast platform you are using. Yes. And if you want to support the show, then head on over to Patreon, where for as little as a dollar, you get access to extended portions of the show. And for five dollars, you get access to uh, exclusive minisodes, which are videos this year. So yeah, very exciting. Yeah. And hopefully they won't just be my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the first one we had a slight technical problem, so it's just 100% pure Dan, which I think is no bad thing. Well, <laughs> He's a yeah. handsome guy. Uh, my wife did say there was a lot of nodding uh, and, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and intent to listening. <laughs> yeah. No, hopefully next time it will be slightly more equal than that. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and if you want some merchandise of our logo, go to Redbubble. And uh, check out their assortment mm. of items that you can buy. Yes. No overthrusters, though. No, not yet. So, Conrad, what is going to be discussed in our next episode? Well, for our next episode, we thought we would celebrate an anniversary. It is the 30th anniversary of the release of the classic science fiction horror film... <laughs> The Lawnmower Man. Ooh. This is going to be surprisingly one of my childhood nostalgia movies. Although I don't actually oh. really remember it being good or bad. I, I had watched it quite a few times as a, as a kid. Oh, well. We will get to rediscover it 30 years on. It stars Jeff Fahey, Pierce Brosnan, I, I believe pre-Bond. Yeah, this is just pre-him right. playing James Bond. Jenny Wright, Jeffrey Lewis, and Austin O'Brien, directed by Brett Leonard, based on a screenplay by Brett Leonard and Gimmel, Gimmel Everett, which they claimed was based on a Stephen King short story, although Stephen King sued them and had his name removed from the really? movie. Really? Really? <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. So it's an interesting topic. <laughs> uh-huh. We're in for a treat, I think. And yeah, there's a lot to talk about, so <laughs> gear up for lawn mowing people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Until next episode, listeners. Goodbye. Bye for now. <laughs>